Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Um, Juan sends his apologies. He had planned to be here today, uh, but unfortunately had to attend to a family emergency. Um, so uh, it falls on me uh, the honor of uh, introducing John Codera, um, who is uh, currently an assistant member in our computational and systems biology program. Uh, John took his BS in biology at Caltech, uh, working first in molecular neurobiology and then um, finding uh, his home in computational chemistry with Jerry Solomon. Uh, he went on to uh, start his graduate studies at UCSF in biophysics, um, initially with um, the late um, Peter Coleman, who um, unfortunately passed away, uh, and uh, John then moved to Ken Dill's lab, uh, where he worked on uh, protein folding. Uh, he continued uh, on to postdoctoral training at Stanford with Vijay Pandey, who uh, initiated the folding at home resource that I think John has leveraged and will tell you about today, um, starting to look at, at protein dynamics and then actually was a, uh, an independent fellow uh, at Berkeley, so he moved uh, up to the East Bay uh, in 2008, from 2008 to 2012. Um, he uh, started his career here at um, Memorial in 2012. We were very fortunate to recruit um, John. He is, I would it's safe to say, the only computational chemist uh, among us, or the only real one anyways. Um, and uh, his lab has invo been involved in um, developing um, fundamentally new computational methods, uh, applying them to drug discovery, uh, including um, concepts in ligand binding and, and also pharmacology. Uh, and as a result of this, John has also been highly collaborative uh, with people here at Memorial uh, and many other institutions to uh, apply his computational tools to a, a, a wide range of um, biomedical problems. Um, so th I'd say the most impressive thing to me as a chemist on John's CV was that his first paper uh, was published in, in JAX, Journal of the American <laughs> Chemical Society, uh, like me. Um, and so uh, unlike me, his, uh, his uh, publication record has gone up um, from there. Uh, so we're looking forward to learning more about your program today, John. Um, welcome. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Derek. I'm super excited to be here today to tell you a little bit about some of the projects that uh, have been going on in our lab and some of the work we've done since I moved to Sloan Kettering about six years ago. But at first, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank the amazingly talented young scientists I've had the great pleasure of working with. Not only have they pushed the boundaries of what biomolecular modeling and simulation can do, especially in terms of cancer, but uh, it's, they've made this whole journey a great deal of fun for me. So uh, I'll tell you that you know, a lot of our understanding of how biology works at the molecular level has really been due to huge advances that have come about through structural biology. So since X-ray crystallography solved the first protein structures, and we now have a, a lot of complementary NMR structures, and now there's a whole revolution going on with cryo-electron microscopy that we're actually harnessing at this institution, we've illuminated a huge number of different biomolecular machines to understand how they work at the molecular level and how things can go wrong in terms of, of disease, and then how can we can restore normal functioning to these uh, by using various small molecule therapeutics. So what you may not know is that the number of structures we've obtained over the last decade alone has more than doubled uh, the number of structures that we have access to. So about 80,000 new structures have been added in the last 10 years alone, and that's really significant for biology and especially the development of new therapeutics because we've only targeted with drugs about 3% of the entire human genome. That's a very small amount, and these other structures are gonna lead us to new insights and new abilities to actually discover and develop new therapies. So structure, though, is only part of the picture. We're missing a lot of what goes on in the context of the dynamics of these systems and how they interact with other things. Even something supposedly as straightforward as the first selective kinase inhibitor, matnib, explaining its great selectivity for ABL over SARC, a 2,500-fold selectivity, uh, is really difficult considering the co-crystal structures look exactly identical. They make exactly identical contacts, and it's really difficult to understand from the, different, from the small differences in interactions where that 2,500-fold difference in selectivity comes from. In fact, we need to go to the dynamics to actually understand that, and I'll tell you more about that later. So molecular simulation, the tool, the main tool that my laboratory practices, can breathe life into these static structures and give us a good picture of what's going on dynamically that can fill in a lot of this missing detail, allowing us to, to make inferences and say, say things or, or provide insights that complement biophysics. But this is 
actually quite challenging. It's not as simple as saying, I'm going to integrate Newton's equations of motion and see what happens. It's not like we're trying to take a spacecraft and then put it on Saturn into insertion orbit uh, four years later, right? That's, that would be very easy by comparison. Instead, we're dealing with something that is mostly boring. It's stochastic motion where there's a lot of wiggling and jiggling. Um, the rare interesting events are actually super hard to pick out, and they're even harder to, to sample because you have to go through all of this dynamics to see something interesting happen. So a lot of our innovation is at the level of trying to figure out very clever ways to sample and study those kinds of rare, interesting events. So my laboratory uses these tools to tackle a wide variety of problems. I'm only going to have, you, uh, have time to tell a, a few stories today about some of the different work, especially as it relates to kinases and their dynamics. I'll tell you uh, uh, in three different parts here. First, how we're, how we're developing new methodologies or applying existing methodologies in innovative ways to tackle questions at the level of uh, biomolecular mechanisms. So how does, how does something work and how can it go wrong in terms of disease? And then I'll turn our attention to how we're using new technologies to actually improve drug discovery uh, success rates, especially in the context of selective kinase inhibitors. And then finally, a new direction for my lab that I'm really excited about is how we can scale up the techniques, these predictive modeling techniques that we're building to actually say something useful about the vast number of clinical mutations that we're seeing from the MSK impact study. We're going to ask questions about whether we can predict whether or not these mutations are going to render the target of therapy susceptible or resistant to different inhibitors, as well as whether we can get a head start on anticipating resistance before we see it in the clinic. So in this first part, I'm going to tell you two little vignettes about how we've been working with very talented experimentalists to illuminate and complement their biophysical, structural biology, and biochemical studies of different systems. The first system, we've been working with Nick Levinson, a very talented structural biologist who runs a laboratory at the University of Minnesota. Um, he's interested in how Aurora A, a kinase uh, which is essential for mitosis and is implicated in multiple cancers, is actually activated through very non-canonical mechanisms. And in the second part of, the talk, uh, part of this vignette, I'll tell you a little bit about how we've been working with our own Minkui Luo to apply some of the methods we originally developed for studying heter conformational heterogeneity in kinases to his own system of epigenetic cancer targets, protein methyltransferases. These guys are, uh, met in particular, set D8, which methylates histone H4K20. Um, it's flexible, it's known to accommodate various substrates, and it's very difficult to engineer selective inhibitors. So we're going to try to see if we can recapitulate the success of kinase selective inhibition with uh, protein methyltransferases. <coughs> So uh, Aurora A is a kinase which is essential for mitosis, and it exists in two distinct pools that are active at different times in mitosis. So early in the mitotic cycle, we have uh, activation of uh, the kinase by phosphorylation, which you might be familiar with. It's the normal way we think of activating kinases. But later on, there's a completely different pool which is kept unphosphorylated by protein phosphatase 6, and this is activated by binding of this allosteric modulator protein, TPX2, so Nick was interested in how these two functionally distinct uh, activation pathways might differ uh, mechanistically. So the, the reason that people here might care, of course, is that uh, Aurora A, it's uh, protein phosphatase, which keeps it unphosphorylated in the, uh, the second pool I mentioned, and its allosteric activator all have either alterations through amplifications or a lot of different uh, mutations associated with cancer. And in fact, uh, there were several Aurora inhibitors that entered clinical trials in the late 2000s, but the clinical response was actually pretty disappointing. And that leads one to question whether or not it's the imperfect selectivity for these inhibitors to select for the two different distinct functional roles that Aurora has in the mitotic cycle that might be partially responsible for this uh, lack of success. So how is a kinase activated? You uh, might have heard of this DFG motif, which is the ASP, Gly motif. This is it highlighted right here from a recent paper where Sonia Henson was able to show how uh, the equilibrium was perturbed for DDR1 kinase. Um, so what happens here is that normally the ASP is out in the inactive state, and then it can flip in in this crankshaft-like motion, uh, coordinating magnesium ATP to render the kinase active. And a few other things happen at the same time, usually the alpha helix, al alpha C helix packs against, <coughs> inserting a residue into the hydrophobic spine. A lot of things happen at the same time to activate this kinase. So Nick was wondering whether TPX2 might activate Aurora by simply inducing a DFG out to in transition. Maybe it binds and induces this switch. So what Nick did is to engineer uh, a cysteine-like mutant in which he then added specific cysteines where he could label them with FRET dyes. And he attached these FRET probes to one stationary part of the C lobe and then a part of the activation loop such that if the DFG is out, which is indicative of an, of an inactive kinase, you'd see a short distance in this activation loop because it packs like this. And if the, the distance is large, that would be indicative of the DFG-ASP having flipped inward to be uh, indicative of the 
of the active kinase. So he did this and found there's a, a 15 angstrom shift, which is huge, a big conformational rearrangement towards a larger distance, meaning it's going from DFG out to in as he adds TPX2. So this is a good indication that TPX2 binding shifts the DFG motif towards, uh, from DFG out to DFG in, but there's a problem. So Nick knew from biochemical studies that uh, adding TPX2 can activate aurora by about 100 fold, which is a huge amount. Um, and so when he added, uh, he took this glutamine 185, which normally inserts from the alpha helix into the hydrophobic spine and engineered this IR probe, it's a nitrile group, uh, in this, using this labeling mechanism to monitor the population of DFG out versus in, he was able to deconvolve the IR absorbance to get the populations. But he only noticed a 3.4 fold shift. That's a three and a half times shift for, towards DFG in. How do you get a hundred fold activation out of a three and a half fold uh, population increase? It doesn't explain the whole story. So he turned to us and said, what is going on? How do I reconcile these two contradictory biophysical experiments to actually understand mechanistically what's going on, get some new ideas, and then verify them? So that's, uh, that's where he turned to us. And it's actually quite difficult to study kinases using molecular simulation. This is not widely appreciated, but you know, the interesting events all happen on the microsecond or longer time scale. And we have to take one femtosecond time steps to get stable dynamics to integrate these with high fidelity. So you're talking about, I need to run at least a billion time steps to even have a chance of seeing something interesting. And that's no small task. So uh, normally you would do this on one of these things. It would be a big CPU cluster. We had one of these when I came to Sloan Kettering. Um, instead, we took advantage of, of what this gentleman is doing, which is giving his money to the computer gaming manufacturers, which is a multi-billion dollar industry that has produced some really amazing technology. These consumer grade GPUs are 500 bucks for nine teraflops, which is an amazing deal because it's 100 times more power per dollar than you would get with CPUs. So over the last decade, I've been collaborating with folks at Stanford to build something called OpenMM, which is an open source GPU accelerated biomolecular simulation code. Uh, there's a lot of people around the world that use it now. It's been downloaded 150,000 times now, so it's had significant impact on the field itself. Um, it's a modern code. It's all written in Python, so you can easily do modeling uh, from, your, from your laptop. And you can take advantage of this enormous increase in computational power. And so Julie Baer, a graduate student in my lab, was able to use these GPU accelerated simulations to run about 100 microseconds of simulation data of, of Aurora with and without TPX2. And she found something very surprising. That's uh, there, when TPX2 binds, there's an ordering of an allosteric water network which coordinates the assembly of the active kinase and the holding of the M magnesium ATP in just the right orientation. And when you look at the correlation times for that ordered subpopulation of waters, it's about 100 nanoseconds. And that jumps out as anyone who's ever studied water dynamics because normal orientational correlation times for waters are in the 10 picosecond re regime. So this is 10,000 times longer lifetimes for those waters. And when you look at, when you have those waters bound, those ordered, ordered allosteric waters, the alpha C helix docks and helps order them as well. So that's this population over here. And when they're not there, then the alpha C helix is undocked. So that's suggesting what's going on is to explain the remainder of the 100-fold allosteric activation is that we have this ultra-stable ordered water network, which is uh, leading to the assembly of the active kinase. So next, Dick turned to the question of what happens when you phosphorylate the kinase. Um, uh, does it shift the DFG out to in like we saw before? And the surprising thing here is that there's no change. There's really no difference in the populations of DFG out versus in on phosphorylating 3 and 288. In fact, Nick didn't believe this at first, so he spent several months doing a different kind of labeling experiment. He figured out how to use EPR probes, labeling them at the same place I showed you the FRET probes earlier, with the same idea of monitoring the distances but getting more resolution of the populations, and he found there really wasn't a population shift. There's not much going on when you instead add uh, a, a, a ADP to these systems. Um, so again, he turned to us to resolve what was going on here, and Stephen Albanese dived in and did some simulations of the phosphorylated and unphosphorylated form and found something, again, surprising, which is that in the unphosphorylated form, this activation loop forms an autoinhibitory helix which prevents the kinase from being active. Um, and it doesn't change the DFG population, but it changes or remodels what's going on inside that DFG in state to make it inactive. When it's phosphorylated, this helix melts and the kinase can assume an active conformation. So this is a very strange way of activating kinase because you're not changing the out to in equilibrium, you're just remodeling the DFG in state. So putting this all together, we're able to come up with a overall picture of what's going on in these two different allosteric, or these two different activation pathways. In the spindle-associated aurora, you adding TPX2 shifts DFG out to in, uh, docks this alpha C helix, orders these waters, and renders the kinase active. 
On the other hand, phosphorylation of uh, 3 nanotube 288 instead remodels the DFG in state by uh, relieving this autoinhibitory helix. And if you do both, you can actually further activate the kinase. And this might be relevant to some diseases because in uh, some melanomas, you have mutations in pho protein phosphatase 6, which prevent it from being unphosphorylated. So you can get both things happening at the same time in ultra-active kinases. And that may be, may be interesting to, to, um, to think about in terms of how to drug each of these individual states of the kinase individually and selectively, selectively to um, uh, improve therapeutic outcomes. So next, I'm going to tell you about um, uh, what happened when I first met Min Kui Lo. So uh, when you know we were developing all of these techniques for studying conformational changes and uh, targeting uh, um, different conformations in kinases, and when I first met him, it was totally obvious to him and I that uh, this would also work for protein methyltransferases, which don't have a lot of great selective matter yet. So instead of transferring a phosphate to the substrate, they transfer a methyl group, uh, and they're important epigenetic writers. They usually methylate uh, histones. Uh, so we, we dove in and tried to see what, what we could do with the, the, uh, set D8 as sort of the, the first model for this. Uh, and this work was really driven by Raffel Viviora in my lab, working very closely with Shi Chen. They were essentially equal partners in everything and did an amazing amount of work and now have a, a manuscript uh, that's under review right now. It's out on BioArchive. Um, so we know that these, uh, these methyltransferases are conformationally heterogeneous because when you have either substrates or different small molecules bound, you see reorganizations that are very difficult to predict. Uh, so that's a challenge for understanding what's going on, but it's also a great opportunity because we know this happens in kinases. Much of the selectivity, that 2,500-fold I told you about imatinib for ABLE over SARC, is that we're selecting for conformations that are not the equilibrium sort of ground state, not the most populous conformations. We have to pay a reorganization energy penalty to get the kinase in that conformation to bind. That subtracts from the binding affinity and gives us the so, sort of overall net uh, free energy binding. And so uh, what happens is that for Sark and Abel, they have different reorganization energy penalties that contribute to uh, the differences or the, the selectivity among the two. And this was sort of the subject of our first NIH grant to sort of map this through the human kinome. So now we're trying to do this for protein methyltransferases as well. But first, we need lots of structures of the protein methyltransferases in interesting different conformations. And Min Kui's lab had this great idea of using chemical inhibitors, something that he's a master of, uh, covalent inhibitors in particular, uh, to trap it in different conformational states, make them uh, the lowest free energy states, and then resolve all these different crystal structures, which showed a lot of heterogeneity primarily in the set I and the post-set motifs. And using those structures, we thought maybe we could start simulations from a lot of these different co-crystal structures and use that to discover new states we hadn't seen before. So uh, understanding um, whether or not we could, we could see things that we haven't seen crystallographically before and sample transitions between all of these states so that we can get the rel relative energetics or populations of the, of the thing. So we need a lot of simulations to actually do that and a lot of computer power, but fortunately we do have access to, as Derek implied, Folding at Home, which is this worldwide distributed computing network that people around the world download a screensaver. These are people who are usually interested in science in some way, so you get to reach into their living rooms and communicate with them, which is super cool in terms of outreach. Um, it was started by Vijay Pandey in about the year 2000, and since then, two million people have downloaded this and contributed non anonymously which is pretty cool. So at any one time right now, over 100,000 people are running simulations for us, often on GPUs. And total, we get 100 petaflops of aggregate computational power. And to give you an idea of how much computer power that is, um, the first single installation supercomputer to reach that level cost $273 million. So that's a lot of computer power for biologists like myself to play with. So what we did is, uh, quite heroically, Raffel set up some simulations and ran six milliseconds of dynamics. So this is now, I think, the world record in terms of how much simulation paper people have put into a single paper. Uh, we were talking about this on Twitter over the weekend. Um, and uh, we need to distill that somehow because you get 10 million snapshots into some simple picture that we humans can understand about what's going on and then something that's interpretable and me make, makes mechanistic predictions about what we can actually do with that. So we, I had spent another decade uh, uh, developing new techniques for understanding protein folding, as Derek alluded to, with the idea that you can describe protein folding as tr stochastic transitions which are the interesting events between 
uh, long-lived kinetically metastable states. And so this has been used to great success uh, in understanding protein folding. So we thought we'd use the same kind of technique, now uh, dressed up to scale to this 10 million snapshot level, uh, to really understand what was going on. And Raffel and she produced this beautiful map of the conformational dynamics. What, it, what this is showing you is that I, we have a bunch of different distinct states that are interesting and different from the APO structure. Some of these are way up to 12 angstroms away from the APO structure. Uh, with the arrows between them showing you the flux between them, the, the, the area of them showing you the populations in equilibrium, and just give you an intuitive idea, uh, Raffel made this movie where he's synthesizing from the model what the dynamics looks like over two milliseconds, which is something you can't normally do. And you'll see there's a lot of conformational dynamics going on. Sometimes they're acting independently, these two motifs. Sometimes they're, they're allosterically coupled together. And you'll notice that transitions back and forth seem to be coupled to this set I domain transitions, and that's actually correct. You see the slowest manifold here is really slow changes in the set I motif as you go back and forth. So this is APO set D8. What he was also able to see is that uh, things that look like the assembled SAM bound and ternary complex states are also <coughs> present at low populations. So we can really say something about the conformational selection that can go on in these, in these cases. So this is, again, APO, but we still observe these uh, binary and ter ternary complex-like structures. Um, you can see that when SAM bounds, that's the cofactor, it orders a lot of the dynamics and restricts what's going on to a great, great deal. And so what they were able to do is to take this and say, can we make some mechanistic predictions about the outcome of experiments that would actually cause a gain of function? So one way to have a gain of function would be to increase the affinity for SAM, for example, and stabilize some of the conformations that are otherwise very rare uh, in the APO state. And so they were able to come up with some cool mutations uh, uh, embedded in this sort of mechanism um, and actually show by biophysical methods, specifically ITC and, ITC and stop flow spectroscopy, that this is actually what's going on. You can actually increase the, the, the rates here. So what's really exciting here is that there's also a lot of mutations for protein methyltransferases in the MSK impact data set. So uh, they took a few of these mutations, and um, Raffel and uh, she ran simulations uh, from a bunch of uh, different structures from our APO state. Uh, to see what is, the, what is the population change we predict for different conformations. And by using that, they were able to annotate what's going on functionally in terms of, or mechanistically with a lot of these mutations. And uh, some of them actually populate really novel conformations that we haven't seen before in the apokinase. They really stabilize distinctly different conformations. And so what we're doing now, uh, as part of the, the next phase of this collaboration, is uh, um, uh, Minkui is very interested in these two proteins, D2 and NSD2, that have, are highly altered in, uh, in different kinds of cancers. And so we're working our way through mechanistically mapping what's going on with all of these mutations in terms of their perturbation on function regulation and selectivity. All right, so for the next part of the talk, I'm going to shift gears and tell you a little bit about how we're developing new methodologies that will actually help us improve drug discovery success rates. So this is something that we've been working on for, for quite a while, and I, I should emphasize that you know, our, our lab is really geared toward developing new modeling tools for problems that can't currently be solved in drug discovery. So we're not just docking something for, for everyone. We're, we're really trying to develop technologies that, that push the frontier of what's possible uh, with predictive modeling right now. So, uh, we're very interested in kinases and selective kinase inhibition in particular because it's so important for cancer. Since the, uh, the FDA approval of imatinib in 2001, we now have something like 43 different small molecule kinase inhibitors and over 100 clinical trials ongoing right now, but still only a small number of kinases that are implicated in cancer have any good drugs out there. Uh, so we'd like to expand that. We'd also like to develop second and third generation therapies or, or things that uh, minimize resistance. But the problem is that <laughs> the pharmaceutical industry is very bad at drug discovery. And they seem to be getting worse with time because the success, or the, this is the number of drugs you get for a billion dollars. And it keeps going down to the point where you now have $1.6 billion per drug. And that's, that's a lot to spend for a drug you actually get to the clinic. And it's very different from other engineering fields where you increase the number of transistors every 18 months, for example, by doubling it following Moore's law. So they've called this Eroom's law because it seems to be that we're getting worse over time rather than better. So that's really frustrating. <clears throat> Uh, it's especially frustrating when you consider other engineering fields where you, know, you don't design an airplane by making 10,000 airplane designs and seeing which ones don't fall out of the sky. That's, that's very different, right? But we, we don't have the, you know, th these are very complex systems subject to very complex design constraints. So are these, but they're very small compared to the big systems that we have to build. And of course, the answer is obvious to everyone here. It's that we have really great 
predictive models of relatively simple physics that describe what's going on here. And you can design things like an airplane in a computer essentially now or figure out if a building is going to fall down in an earthquake. So we don't have the same kinds of good predictive models to help us design at the microscopic scale. And that's one of the things that my lab is obsessed with building. So if you think about how, you know, what is the threshold, what's the bar we have to achieve to have some impact here, think about optimizing on this scaffold, something that Watek thinks about all the time, um, trying to improve the affinity and maybe reaching a one log unit improvement in, in affinity or, or potency. So uh, that would be this threshold here in terms of binding free energy. Unfortunately, we have some good historical data when Scott Brown went into Abbott, Abbott uh, Pharmaceuticals uh, MedChem database and found what, when chemists are trying to improve by one log unit, how often do they succeed? And unfortunately, chemists can be quite well modeled by a Gaussian centered around zero. So uh, half the time they don't succeed and half the time they improve the affinity, but only the shaded region here communicates the, frac the probability that a new molecule they synthesize is going to have that one log unit increase in affinity. So if we had a method that was even 2 kcal per mole inaccurate, that would still be enough to speed this process up in terms of making Watek work three times less hard um, uh, by factor of three, which would be fantastic. And if we could get to half a kcal per mole accuracy, what they call chemical accuracy, we could speed that up by a factor of almost 10. So how would you actually do this? If you could run molecular simulations following Newton's laws, you just run a very long simulation perhaps and look at the ligand binding and unbinding, and then look at the fraction of time unbound versus bound, and you get a KD that way. Um, and what's great, uh, for example, if you're a billionaire living on the west side of Manhattan, uh, you might design a specialized chip and put it inside of a $50 million supercomputer and run this for quite some time and find, oh yes, at least the force field models that we use to model these systems are good enough to see ligand binding, and that's fantastic. It means that they're probably up, the, up to the task of doing something useful. But now to compare two molecules that Watek might want to synthesize before he actually does it, we actually need to watch them come on and off many, many times to get a good statistically reliable estimate of how different they are. And that would take us something like, uh, well, it turns out uh, 10 to the sixth years in terms of wall clock time. And I would like my graduate students to be here less than 10 to the sixth years because otherwise Derek gets very antsy. Um, so instead we use a completely different approach. And this approach is very mathematically uh, based in terms of trying, using ideas from statistical inference. We spend a lot of time developing it along with a lot of other people uh, to try to make it work. But we can cut this time down to hours by breaking the calculation into these weird non-physical thermodynamic cycles that turn the ligand into something else through various stages that can't possibly exist in chemistry. So you end up simulating all of these weird intermediates where you impose some restraints, you turn off the charges so you have a greasy blob, you turn off the interactions with the rest of the protein, and so you have this weird thing that can interpenetrate the rest of the protein or the solvent. And by putting that all together, you can get the overall free energy of binding for each of these legs and add them all up. And uh, essentially what we're doing is we're taking a very hard to compute ratio and breaking it into very easy to compute ratios. That's the basic idea. There's a lot of, a lot of technology behind it. <clears throat> so we can use this technique to answer two kinds of questions that are highly relevant to cancer therapy. The first is, if you change the molecule by a few atoms, what does that do to the binding affinity to your target or anti-target? And the other question is, if you change the target by a few atoms, that is, you have a resistance mutation or a mutation from the clinic, how does that change your affinity for the drug you might want to use or other drugs that you have available to you? So uh, we again spent some time where we developed a lot of technology in the lab. Uh, in this case, uh, mostly Andrea Ritzi and Levi Naden, a former postdoc in the lab, uh, developed this great tool that is an open platform, open source code. Um, that was actually paid for by a large number of different partners, everything from pharmaceutical companies to uh, federal agencies, that incorporates everything we know about how to do these calculations efficiently and correctly um, into a single tool that's sort of a good platform, again, built on this OpenMM thing that we had invested in. And so we can use this tool to do a lot of uh, predictions, but first we need a graphics processor to run it on. So when I got here in 2013, I combined efforts with uh, Gunnar Rech. Uh, to build the first major GPU installation for um, an academic cluster using consumer-grade GPUs. So we bought 120 of these things, and uh, the good folks at the CBio um, uh, core uh, helped out with this. Uh, we got 420 teraflops for $80,000, which I thought was a great deal at the time. And it was maybe a little bit weird and out there, but it's, it powered our laboratory for many years, and now the second generation version led by Juan Perrin uh, supports 274 users on this GPU-enabled cluster to do everything from machine learning to computational pathology to cryogenic structural biology, all of it's using these GPUs now, and of course, drug discovery. <clears throat> So how well does it work? So we've been working with folks at Merck in Darmstadt. 
uh, as part of a collaboration to try to benchmark the accuracy of these different methods and try different ideas. And uh, we've been working with this CMET set, for example, that they've published and looking at the relative free energies and how well we can predict them. That is, what is the change uh, in free energy between two different compounds? And it looks like we're doing pretty okay. We're under that 2 kcal per mole threshold, which is what I said was the, the beginning of being useful for people like Watek. So if you ask the question about, uh, like, if I give a threshold between two compounds that I say, if this compound is predicted to bind better than half a kcal per mole, um, how often do I get the sign right? How often do I actually make the right decision so that uh, I win a bet with Watex, say? Um, and it looks like for about half a kcal per mole, I can get that around 85% of the time, which is, is pretty good gambling odds. Um, there's a lot of work to do to make this even more robust and more accurate, but I think it's a really good start. And you know, we're not the only people to have this technology now. For the last five years, I'd spent uh, time consulting with Schrodinger to take some of these advances from the field and really help get them into a commercially available product that you can use with a single button click. So it's not a research thing. It's a complete black box thing that people can run in the drug discovery industry. And it's really helped companies like Nimbus, for example, at the late stages, deliver their $1.2 billion uh, uh, Nash uh, drug. Um, and other companies are using it for anything that's structure enabled, essentially. But most of what they've been doing has been limited to affinity optimization. I said that my laboratory is working at all of the next frontier of things. So we've been thinking about what's next, um, in particular predicting selectivities or other things like partition coefficients and solubilities, which are really important in multi-objective optimization of molecules. We'd like to jump directly to things that actually work well in cells rather than having to optimize every property uh, once we run into an issue. So Stephen Albanese spent some time working on uh, how well we can predict selectivities, especially for kinases. So he found some cool MedChem data sets published in JMedChem where they're looking at CDK9-2 selectivity, where uh, if you inhibit C CDK9, it, it reinstates apoptosis in some cancer cells. That's great. If you inhibit CDK2, it kind of kills everything. So that's bad. So you'd like to inhibit one and not the other. And it's actually very difficult to achieve selectivity. So they were looking at variations on this scaffold. And uh, Stephen did this while he was uh, spending some time as an intern at Schrodinger. So he was collaborating with Lingla Wang, somebody I, I worked with closely there, um, to try to see how well the commercial tool and the, the private force field, OPLS3, is actually able to drive selectivity. And it looks like individually, the CDK2 and 9 potencies are reproduced pretty well. But it's harder to wrap your head around what this means for the ability to predict selective inhibitions if you look at the selectivities as delta delta Gs between the two. So Stephen dove in and uh, developed a, a useful model that looks at the correlations in the errors between CDK2 and CDK9. So you might hope that <clears throat> if there's, uh, you know, if you're making an error in, in, in each of the kinases, um, you'd, you'd say something like, uh, since the interactions are essentially the same in two very similar kinases, that I might have a fortuitous cancellation of errors, and it might be an easier job. And we can quantify that by this error correlation coefficient, which basically measures how diagonal that is. And if you're trying to achieve a hundredfold selectivity, that's this green line here, it looks like from our limited data set, the correlation coefficient is somewhere in the shaded region. So you would get a, some, a speed up of trying to hit that 100 times selectivity goal by a factor of 20 or 40. And now we're talking something that's a lot more than three or four times speed up. So it looks like uh, you know, while achieving 100-fold selectivity can be difficult, this tool could really help uh, improve things substantially. But of course, we want all of our colleagues to be able to access this and all of our, our collaborators elsewhere as well. So I recently joined the scientific advisory board of, of uh, OpenEye Scientific, which is building an Amazon workflow-enabled uh, browser-based way of running molecular ca uh, calculations of various kinds. So you could do modeling in your browser and this tool, Orion, will be free for academics. And they want to deploy a lot of uh, free and open source uh, academic software like ours through this, where now you'll be able to load up these binding free energy calculators. And from Derek's desktop or laptop, he can actually submit jobs and hopefully help uh, optimize uh, the compounds before he actually makes them and improve our success rates that way. So we're excited to roll this out early next year. <clears throat> We've also been working to make the public force fields as good as the private force fields. Right now, you really have to pay a lot for these, uh, for these Schrodinger uh, software, and we don't like that, and a lot of pharma doesn't like that either. So they've banded together and uh, built this open force field consortium, which is using open source software, uh, open data sets in collaboration with NIST, and trying to do everything out in the open to, uh, with this large collaboration of academics to really push force field science forward. So this just premiered uh, October 1st, so we're super excited about that. So in the last few minutes, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the, the final thing that I'm really excited about is how we can predict drug resistance and susceptibility using, by scaling up these modeling tools. 
And I, you, you all know that there's multiple forms of resistance, and uh, in particular, there's so many ways in which we can have resistance to particular drugs. We're going to focus for right now on uh, mutations in the target of therapy, because if your drug is not simply not going to bind the target, it's, it's no use to pursue it. It's not going to work. Um, so uh, in this case, Stephen also went into the MSK impact data set and looked for all of the mutations that appear in the kinases in that panel. And uh, a lot of these mutations, so you're familiar with the, the recurrent mutations like L858R and EGFR. You talk about them all the time. There's some drugs that are, are uh, targeted to these. But the vast majority of mutations that you see are actually this long tail of very rare mutations. So 87% of the mutations in kinases have been seen fewer than 10 times. That means we have no biochemical data or understanding of what clinical outcomes are associated with, with different um, uh, dosing regimens, for example, 68% um, of them have been seen only once. So if there was some way we could predict whether or not these are going to render the target of therapy susceptible or, uh, or resistant, that would be fantastically amazing. So we were working with a very talented uh, postdoc at Schrodinger named Kevin Hauser, um, who compiled a lot of data from the literature in this particular case and uh, uh, found mutations all over ABL kinase for a number of different uh, drugs for which the IC50s were available. IC50s are not great. I'll come back to that in a moment but at least it's some data about how effective the drugs actually are against cell lines. And uh, using free energy calculations of mutations now, he was able to show uh, that we got really good correlation. In fact, uh, the error is pretty small. There's some outliers here that we're still trying to understand, but we're about a kcal per mole accuracy, which is pretty good. And if you look at the uh, accuracy, specificity, and sensitivity, well, it's, it's not to the point where we'd want to roll it out to patients yet, but it's clearly showing some signal there. There's, there's something exciting here in that we'll be able to hopefully soon, once we've understood the failures, use physical modeling to predict whether or not mutations render it susceptible to the therapy you want to use or, or uh, something else that you might want to use. Now, if you think about anticipating resistance before it appears in the clinic, uh, the question is, you know, why, how could we even predict something like that? And the cool thing is that if you give a matinib, well, it's, it's not cool, it's actually very sad. Um, sorry. Uh, if you give a matinib to patients and they fail out of a matinib therapy because of progression, um, when they, depending upon which second-line therapy you use, desatinib or nilotinib, you can see very different dynamics for the evolution of, or emergence of resistant clones. So for example, giving them desatinib, you'll see a, a depletion of this F359V, but giving them nilotinib, you can actually see enrichment. So it looks like we're performing a selection experiment where the affinity of the inhibitor for the, the, as well as the affinity of something like ATP for the kinase is going to be driving the fitness of these particular clones. So we might be able to use free energies, these things that we're computing as a surrogate for fitness and understanding the evolution of these. And we can ask all sorts of interesting questions using these free energy tools, whether or not, obviously whether a mutation confers, confers resistance or sensitivity, but uh, as, actually anticipating it using this as a selection criteria, or maybe quantifying the potential of two different clinical candidates to elicit resistance, or maybe we could even engineer inhibitors that are unlikely to elicit resistance through mutational mechanisms. That's a pie in the sky dream, but I think I'm very excited about that. So part of the problem here is that we're limited by the quality of data that we have. This is the correlation of IC50 derived affinity changes with KDs. It's not great. It's about the error that we're at right now. So to go any further, we're going to have to do better in terms of data collection. And the amount of data we have is really limited, whereas the amount of data CBioPortal has is, is amazingly large. So the folks in the lab have put together a concerted effort where they've, they've figured out how to express a panel of different human kinase domains in bacteria using this cool phosphatase co-expression system that Marcus Seliger at Stony Brook has figured out. They've also figured out how to automatically uh, engineer in uh, different mutations from CBioPortal and express them in one-mill cultures uh, for different uh, proteins. Um, and so we can start engineering these, and then we needed a way to measure good biophysical affinities. And Nick Levinson happened to uh, note when he was with Steve Boxer this phenomena that uh, basutinib, or lotinib, and gefitinib strongly for us upon binding their, their kinase inhibitors. And Sonia Henson, a postdoc in my lab, actually mapped out a bunch of different FDA inhibitors. Basically, anything with a bi or tricyclic. Uh, heterocyclic aromatic ring has this phenomena that you see a huge increase in fluorescence and you can directly measure the binding affinity or you can compete this guy off with a non-fluorescent inhibitor to measure the affinities. So now we have an assay. A bunch of folks in the lab have gone together. You may have seen our wet lab on the 17th floor. It's a giant robot that can do the expression, uh, the uh, purification, and also this assay in large scale. Uh, and they've been working on automating this uh, to a degree where we can grind through a lot of these and start to collect a lot of interesting data. And I'm super excited about this because it's going to really give us a huge, uh, vast biophysical archive and, and look into what's going on in terms of resistance. 
And so we've started also to collaborate with some other folks on how to bring machine learning techniques into this mix. Once we generate enough data biophysically and uh, through free energy calculations, there's something called Inspire, which is bringing together folks from the, the um, Candle, uh, uh, this is Rick Stevens in particular, um, uh, the Candle Consortium, um, and really trying to work with multiple laboratories looking at these data sets. Uh, also using very large computers. Right now we're on Titan, which has 18,000 uh, CPUs, and Summit just came online, which gives us 15, more GP 15 times more GPUs. And I'm super excited because I get to start a satellite group in Berlin working with one of the foremost structural biology uh, for kinase polypharmacology, machine learning people, Andrea Volkemer. Um, we'll be starting a satellite group to merge our free energy calculations with these uh, structure-informed machine learning techniques that she practices. And so we're starting to hire some folks to look into this cool interface. So uh, I'll just remind you that our laboratory does a lot of other things too. Uh, we've really enjoyed all the collaborations we've had over the past few years. And I've had you know, the great fortune of working with a very large number of collaborators. I've had a lot of fun people coming through my lab. And I think I mentioned the ones whose work I talked about. And then we're super grateful to all of these different funding agencies for helping power our work. And uh, thank you all for showing up. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. <clears throat> the floor is open for questions. Maybe I'll start. John, in the, in the set eight story, you mentioned that the arrow thickness was a measure of the flux between the different conformational states. Could, so can that be interpreted as transition state energy between different conformations? And if so, can you then model what KCAT and KM should be based on SAM concentration and the population, the kinetics of accessing the SAM bound conformation? That's a great question. Well, so it's not as simple as thinking about chemical reactions where you have a single barrier and a single transition state. These are highly uh, you know, delocalized transition states. You have the same problem in protein folding where it's really hard to describe them with a single coordinate. But your idea about modeling the, the kinetics of the overall progression through the reactive cycle, including analytical theories of how SAM binds in a diffusion limited minor, totally on our roadmap. So uh, uh, Rafael already has simulations of all the different assembly states with all the different cofactors and substrates and different forms of being uh, methyl transferred or not. Um, and we're going to put that all together by stacking these models up and then adding analytical models between the states. So it's a great idea, and uh, we're way ahead of you. Good. Questions from the floor? Especially. John, on your first project, you see the, uh, the uh, signal change in the EPR, large signal change. Uh, how you no, interpret that single radar to the multiple confirmations. So that's also involve how accurate your prediction of the potential confirmation is, how that reflects the signal change, right? That, that's a great question. So it, I have to say that the analysis in this case was not mapping specifically to confirmations. It's using the raw EPR data, data which I did not show here, uh, but to do a multi-Gaussian fit. So it's a complicated process. It also involves you have to classify the sample to get the good signal to noise ratio. And that may also alter because it takes a finite amount of time to quench these things. So there's other things too. It turns out that this same measurement was also done by both single molecule FRET by another laboratory um, uh, and uh, by uh, FRET himself uh, using Nick. Nick himself did not single molecule, but bulk fret to find much the same thing. So you're absolutely right. I, EPR is something I would love to get into in terms of quantitative models of reproducing spectroscopically directly from the molecular simulations. It, it's possible, um, but we ju just haven't done that direct connection with structure yet. That's a great question. So it's available now. There's a, a minimal force field out there, which is just so instead of GAF, which is, GAF is the general amber force field that people still use for public simulations of, of protein ligand systems today. It's supposed to type small organic molecules. It was finished when I started in Peter Coleman's lab in 1999, um, so it hasn't really changed since then, and, which means that we're way behind in terms of accuracy for everyone else. Um, so this new effort simplifies all of this by using a new way of typing. So it used to be we used atom types, which had to encode in one letter everything you ever want to say about the chemical environment of that atom. Instead, we're using something called SMARTS, uh, which is industry standard way of, 
of matching subgroups of chemistry and can be as elaborate as you want. And that allows us to compress everything down to about 300 lines and type a much broader level of, uh, of chemistry, of, of drug bank that way. Um, and so we're at a baseline that's equivalent to GAF, and now we're working on optimizing that iteratively by improving the torsion, so Haya Stern is working on that. We're working on uh, ad adaptively determining the complexities we need in a manner that's statistically informed rather than just something that Peter has guessed from looking at a column of numbers. So uh, Josh Foss in my lab is working on that, but it's a real multi-site collaboration. So other people are contributing different aspects of this whole collaboration. There's a site called openforcefield.org which has all of the gory details, so I'll let you read our roadmap about that. There is a folding coin. Uh, I don't endorse it. We have nothing officially to do with it. But there's some people making a lot of money off of this. So uh, go out and check it out. It's always kind of weird. But they do some interesting publicity for us. So there is a folding coin. Um, more specifically, though, it, so that's just tied, tied to folding at home points, which are Previously, people would get points. You can't turn in the points for anything. It's not like you can go trade it for a stuffed animal or anything. But people just organize into teams and compete to get more points than the other team, which is great. I, but they, they enjoy sharing aspects of the science, too, and communicating with each other, which I fully endorse. Um, we're actually working with another, another company uh, to run uh, some of our force field calculations, a huge number of quantum calculations, on something that is a platform like the modern Golem or um, other kinds of coin-like things. So, uh, but that, they want to do some things that for the public good for free. Um, and so we obviously can use all the computer time in the world. All right. If there's no more questions, we'll just thank John again. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it.